So hi everyone, um, we will now aim to get started. It's quarter past three. Um, so in the interest of keeping to time, uh, we will move on. So I'm so pleased to let you all know, you'll see Mary's uh, very happy smiley face there. We've got Mary Jacob back on and Mary's gonna talk to us today about designing active cognitive tasks to promote learning. So over to you, Mary. Thank you very much. And while I'm navigating to the right window to share my screen, I just want to say publicly what a, a big thanks to you, Phil, for organizing all of these series and um, keep on doing it. I think it has a big impact and it really is a great contribution to our community. Oh, it's very so, kind. Thank you. Well, it's true. So. So today I'm going to talk about designing what I call ACTS, Active Cognitive Tasks to Promote, and I, I've added the word active learning in there. Um, I am a member of the Learning and Teaching Enhancement Unit at Aberystwyth University, and I lead on our PG CERT program, so I'll be showing you some examples from that. So the first thing I want to say is that I'm giving you a task. While you're listening to this talk, please consider how you can use these frameworks to go beyond delivering content. And maybe some of these things you're already doing, which, which is great, because I have a lot of inspiring people here today. Um, and think about possible acts that you could design to help your own students learn. So how you can use the frameworks and how you might design an act yourself. And I'll be asking you for that at the end. So this is my key message, really. Active learning for me is when students do an active cognitive task and this talk today is based on a chapter I have in a forthcoming book edited by Wendy Garnum and Isabel Gowers and being published under as part of a CETA series um, about active learning in higher education. So you'll be able to read more about it there. So the first thing is we have to define active learning. What is it? And I love the Bonwell and Asen seminal definition where students are doing higher order thinking tasks. They're doing things and thinking about what they're doing. So it's not just carrying out procedures. And in terms of learning design, I think one of the big roles that ACTS can play is to link the independent work and the class session. You could go in either direction really, or it could even be within a class session, but it's, it's a really nice way to link that preparation and the interactive part of your teaching. So what is an active cognitive task? Well, it has to be active. So that means active, not passive. So students have to own that learning process. They have to take responsibility for their learning. And to do that requires that we build mutual trust and we give students some agency. And we've heard a lot about, uh, about that with some of the other examples um, earlier this afternoon already, where students have control of what they're learning so it needs to be cognitive and that's the thinking part. So this, you know, load of wonderful evidence from cognitive science. You can find ways to support your students in constructing mental schemas, reinforcing connections, putting information into their long term memory in a meaningful way. And this is where things like effortful learning and desirable difficulty can come into play. Um, so the final one is the task. They have to carry out a task, not just passively absorb information, hope that it sticks, or perform an operation by rote. They ha it's really not the content that matters the most. It's what they do with the content. So I would argue that your the students who are getting the highest marks, the best performing students, are probably designing their own active cognitive tasks for themselves anyway, but it's the ones in the middle and the ones who need it the most where they will benefit from us designing these for them, just being transparent. So how can we make sure that our task is active? So the framework that I like for this is the ICAP model by Micheline Chi. This is, she's the head of a cognitive science lab and she subdivided act active learning into three categories, interactive, constructive, and active. So what the evidence shows is that where students are interacting with each other, interacting with the teacher, even interacting with material, the learning gain is bigger. If they are just working alone, they can still be constructing their knowledge. That is sort of, they can do that individually or they can do that interactively with their peers. 
that is a very powerful learning tool. If they're just doing something maybe physical, like underlining, you know, manipulating objects, some of these very basic levels, they can still learn, but the, the learning gain won't be as great. So the idea with this model is to push as far to the left in her table as you can. So how do we make it cognitive? What about the thinking part? And, you know, let's go back to basics. Bloom's taxonomy is a really good tool for that. The higher order thinking is generally considered to be create or synthesize, evaluate. I would include analyze and apply as well. Um, if all you're doing is having students understand and remember, that's probably not enough. They have to do that, yes, but they will learn better if you can push higher on Bloom's taxonomy than that. So you include that, but you push higher as well. So that's where you're going to get your act with a create, synthesize, evaluate, analyze. So um, what do we do about finding tasks? How do we know that we're, we're, we're finding useful tasks? I love the ABC learning design types of learning. This is based on Diana Larlard's types of learning. Um, I love their model. There are six types of learning here, acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice, and production. I won't go into them in detail, but I will give you the link to where you can read more if, you, if you're not already familiar with this. So the idea of this is to think, what is the right balance for your students, for your learning uh, context? So there's no one size fits all solution. It might be something like this. It might be something like this. You find the right balance that is going to work for in your teaching. Um, but the idea is to think beyond the normal automatic go to options you would choose, um, but to con consider all six of these and see what is the right balance among them. Um, so that's the learning design part. I mean, Diana Larlard is sort of the, um, the doyen of learning design. So how can we turn passive learning into active learning with ACTS? Um, I've got two ex examples here, broad categories of things we'll probably do in many of our teaching contexts. We often have students either watch a video or come to lecture. And if we don't give them an ACT, they are the ones in the middle and at the bottom are likely to just go into passive mode, just let it wash all over them and hope that some of it sticks. Not much of it is going to stick if that's all they do. So we need to let them know, we need to design in the ways to help that material stick. So we tell them, what do we want them to do it during my lecture? Define the key terms in your own words, find real world examples, link new ideas to prior knowledge, or you know, this is these are just ex uh, samples. This isn't the full list. Find whatever works for your context. What do you want your students to do with that information you give them in a lecture? And then for the material that they're engaging with in their independent study, often reading, yeah, no matter what it might be, um, an article, a chapter, a web page, whatever, what do we want them to do while they're reading? Not just read this article and come to seminar ready to discuss. What are we going to discuss? What do you want me to notice about this article? So do you want them to evaluate the argument? Do you want them to see whether, make a judgment, an evaluative uh, critical decision? Does the evidence support the conclusions? Do you want them to try and apply this idea in, in practice or fit the new ideas with the prior knowledge? This is kind of similar to the one above. How do you want them to engage cognitively with that material? So it's really useful for us to design that in from the beginning. So I'm going to give you a little example from the PGCTHE seminar series. I, I run one seminar a month. It's op, it's optional, so I don't get the whole cohort. I probably have five, six, you know, maybe eight or ten people in there at a, at a time. Could be a bit more than that. So here's how I give them a preparation task. So I gave them, I did this um, a couple of months ago. I did this in September. So I gave them a web page that had a concise definition of this model. I gave, then I gave them an, an annotated article, the full peer reviewed article, and then I gave them the task, choose one of your real assessments to share and workshop during the session, including one of the outcomes. So that's part of the preparation. But I also, and I think this is really important, 
when I give them the preparation, I explain the link. How does the preparation, why do you need to do this before you come to the seminar? So this is a summary of, the, of the, what's going to happen in the live seminar. And so what I do is, in this case, I gave a comprehension check first using retrieval practice. So that's the remember, understand part. Then we had a discussion using critical thinking, evaluation, creation, um, concrete examples, links to prior knowledge, application. All of this took place during the live interaction so that our seminar was fully discussion. Nobody's telling the students stuff. I'm asking them questions and they're, in, and they're contributing their ideas. So they know exactly what's going to happen in advance. So here's, sorry, my cat's playing with a ball right now. I hope you can't hear that. Um, here's how I annotate the article. So the thought questions here, the first thing is, is not a question, but an indication of the task where I want them to focus in the article. Then why is this method helpful? So that's a, both comprehension and evaluation. Um, Using the framework, evaluate your own teaching. So that's applic also application and evaluation. And then how we can tweak our assessments, that's asking them to create. So they're thinking about this in advance of the live seminar. Then during the seminar, I, I give them a Word document with a worksheet in it. You could do this in Google Docs. You could maybe use Mentimeter or something for online for them to contribute. I do, I'm running these still via Teams. Uh, you could use OneDrive. So it's a shared document and it's got a table like this. And so I give them two or three minutes at the beginning of the seminar. OK, type in your ideas into this table. They're all doing it at the same time. Much more participation, much more contribution. Um, and once we get that into the document, then we discuss it and we expand on it and we build out the document. And then, of course, they can save the document for future reference with everybody's contributions in it. So they don't need to take external notes on what we're talking about. But there's no way they can be passive during my seminar. So and in this particular example, the first question, how authentic is it based on the eight elements, requires a, that they apply and evaluate. And the second question here, how can you make it more authentic? I'm asking them to create, to develop, and we do this collaboratively. So as you can tell, I get excited about this. Um, so it has results. What I've observed, because I've taught many seminars that were face-to-face -face where you, a lot of people don't read the article, they sit back, they want to listen to other people explain the article, um, and that only the usual suspects contribute. More people read the article, all of them or almost all of them, maybe one person once in a while, but usually they all do. I get much more balanced contribution, so I don't have that usual suspects for the first two people who speak dominate and then everybody else sits back and goes in passive learning mode. I don't want that. So they have more balanced contributions. And I think this is because it's more inclusive to give them multiple means of contributing. So that's that UDL, Universal Design for Learning principle. So they can write or they can speak or they can do a combination of both. So I find everybody or almost, you know, may, almost everybody in that session, if not every single person will contribute. So, but what the most important thing is, does it make a difference in their learning? And I'm sure you can anticipate my answer is going to be, Yes, I've just finished. I, I can't tell you how happy I am. I've had three weeks of intensive marking and their reflective narrative showed an in-depth discussion of how they understood those readings in the seminar, how they investigated further to build on that knowledge and apply those principles in their own practice. So yes, I have concrete evidence that this method works for real learning and a much deeper engagement with the content that I'm trying to teach them. So now I'm going to switch over to this mode and I'm going to invite you, whoever is here and We've has an idea. One minute left. For me, for my 10 minutes. But uh, well, that's actually going to be 15, Mary. It's a <laughs> that's my 15. OK, this is the last slide. Put in the chat if you've thought of an idea for an app that you might design or how you might use a framework. That's the final thing. Thank you very much. I'm going to go out of 
sharing mode. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, <laughs> that was a real treasure chest of a uh, of a talk. So much information. Um, I'm so sorry because we've run to 15 minutes. We don't have time for questions. But what I will say is I wrote down about six questions and you actually answered each of them every time I'd written it down. So I don't know how you were doing that, but you did. So it's um, it was fantastic. It really was. I think there was some questions in the chat as well, and I may have one that I might stick in there as well. So if you could have a look at some point, that would be so good. But yeah, what a great I'm, talk. Thank you. I'm going to put a link to where you guys can download a handout that goes with this. Um, there we go in the chat. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks to Clive and Natasha.